this place, look at it. Just look around you and look at the beauty that, 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 and the potential. And then look at what's left now because of people and mankind and their hasty waste. I mean, look at this person's dream home that they built here. Look at it now, it's a shit box where people go and smoke dope and fucking hang out late at night and try to fuck some chick from up the street, if there's one anywhere, because I met the only one here and she's crazy as fuck. You don't want nothing to do with her, but I'm in love with her. She's somewhere around here hiding in one of these places. Smell that? Dead fish. Standing here and just looking at it, like through your screen right now, you'll have no idea the environmental disaster that this place is. There's some toxic problems going on here. The Salton Sea is the biggest body of water in California a 380-square-mile lake in the middle of the desert between the Coachella Valley and the Mexican border. Today, the sea is best known for the decaying resorts that litter the shoreline. But just a few decades ago, it was booming. Here in the desert, a sea called Salton Sea, landlocked, rich in beauty and allure, sportsman's paradise, the new recreational capital of the world, attracting tremendous numbers of water skiers and boaters, and just plain people all the year round. They called the Salton Sea a miracle in the desert, but it was an epic mistake that created it. In 1905, engineers were digging a canal to divert water to farmers in Southern California. After cutting too deep into the banks of the Colorado River, water poured into a desert sink for almost two years. The lake should have evaporated, but agricultural runoff from nearby farms kept it topped up. Developers saw the sea as the perfect place to build a new resort playground. And for a while, it worked. From the 50s to the 70s, the sea attracted millions of tourists. But trouble was lurking beneath the surface. the sea was becoming saltier and more polluted. And by the late 70s, it started to smell. Then came algae blooms and fish die-offs of biblical proportions. Now the sea is shrinking, and toxic dust storms are the latest plague. There's not a lot going on around here. It's about noon, nice day. I'm seeing a mix of houses and mobile homes and empty buildings. I think this is the old marina. Oh, there's a pool. I wonder if the rat pack swam in this pool. You think the rat pack swam in there? Sammy Davis, Sinatra. Yeah, they did. Just reading some of the uh, outdoor art here. One of them says, good luck, don't die. 
uh, low tide, low life. This person really likes their cat. Seems like it might have been a happening spot. A lot of boats coming in and maybe a little swimming and hot tubbing. Um, you can't swim or hot tub and there's no way you can get a boat in here anymore. So things have changed. Oh, good jets. I think the general perception of this place is that it's poisonous. There's a billion dead fish everywhere. It stinks all the time. It's hotter than hell. And there's just like crazy, whacked out, weird desert, desert people everywhere. But I think that the story is a little different than that. I think, yeah, it has some of those elements, but there's a lot of like normal American life here as well. The ironic thing about this place is that this is the place where all the people with money would come and, you know, ball out. And now, this is the place where people with no money come because it is so affordable for them to live here. I'm on my way to the Sunny Bono Wildlife Refuge. I'm gonna meet up with some high school kids and go on a field trip, get their point of view of what it's like to live at the Salton Sea. How do you guys like living in this area? It sucks. It's calm and it sucks? Yes. <laughs> Too calm for high school. Yeah. If you want to do anything, really, if you want to go out to the movies or go to a mall, yeah. you have to drive for like an hour or two. An hour away? Or two. We recently got Jack in the Box and that's... Yeah, Fast food. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the closest thing we have to a hangout. Why is it that I always see music videos shot out here? Because it looks like the apocalypse. Yeah. Apocalypse sells. Apocalypse sells, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what are we looking at over here? What's all this? That is how much the water used to be. How Where far the water up the level water. Was at. Oh, it receded from here mm -hmm. all the way to over there? Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's that's a far distance. Yeah, it, was a, it was about six feet a year. Still about six feet a year. Six feet a year? You see, looking back, this was just the walk up to the hill. All yeah. of that used to be full of water. Right. All of this and bottom then part. Past this little ledge over here as right. well. And is it going to slow down or? It actually has been drying up exponentially, so it's going to get worse. Oh, it is. Very, it's very, very big. Yeah. It, do, it looks like the ocean. So do these sandy areas, do they kick up a lot of dust? Yeah, they do. Yes. A lot of the people from the local communities like Nyland and Calipatria yeah. complain about the air quality and how, right. especially people with asthma, they have a hard time breathing. All the communities around the Salt Sea are low income yep. families. Yep. And they don't have a choice to move away. Sure. So they have to be here. Right. I mean, if they could provide better air quality for their children, I mean, I'm pretty sure, sure they, they would. would. Wow. And if it completely dries up, then it's going to be worse. It's going to reach all the way to cities that are going to start to care because then they're going to be affected by it. So the wind will pick this up, like all the chemicals and dust, and bring it over to LA? All the yes. way through the valley, yeah. Yeah. Just carry it all the way up It'll to LA, yeah. Through. And then they won't just have smog to deal with. They'll have this to deal with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they'll really care. Yeah. Then they'll wish the Salton Sea was back. What do you think the future is for the sea? Until LA cares that we're here because it's affecting them. Yeah. And the other big cities like LA, yeah. no, it, nobody's going to do anything. Right. Everyone wants to help, but yeah. it's not, there hasn't been an official plan, right. one plan for everyone to follow uh, so that we can actually change. There's a lot of empathy, but there's just not a lot of action. Exactly. Yeah. It's so crazy that the largest lake in California is an accident. It's the Mistake Lake. These kids, they're 16, 17, and they just know they want to go out of here, get a better education, get better work, and then come back and help their families out, which, uh, 
I think is a really uh, a nice sentiment. They think that no one cares about their town and the health problems that they're suffering from the dust. And it kind of feels like they almost hope that it gets worse so that it could get better. For now, the sea is shrinking. Water and air pollution are getting worse. And seaside towns have seen better days. I ran into a local named Raimundo near the Salton Sea Beach in an area he calls the Salty. These were like yeah, premier what, what, vacation homes. What happened to these places? The people moved out. I mean, they don't want like the smell. The, the properties lost their value. People left. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. No, nobody wanted to stay anymore. And now it's um, just falling into the ground? And now it's just wasting away. This place was the vacation spot. I mean, Elvis was out here, John F. Kennedy was out here, you know. The fishing here was off the hook. There was Corvina running. It was there on was, the hook. There, yeah, it was yeah, definitely on the hook and running. <laughs> the fact of the matter is the, the water's become so low that you could literally almost walk all the way across the Salton Sea. Really? If you wouldn't sink so far into the mud. Right, it's mucky. It is real mucky. I've actually lost shoes and they're going to cut mesquite out. Oh, you know, really? There's mesquite trees everywhere, and mesquite's good to cook with. And, yeah. and what man doesn't want to cook with wood? I don't know. I, I mean, I like meat, and I like it cooked. So yeah. why not use wood? It's free. So is the water good to go in, or what? Um, it used to be. And uh, the problem with letting this place go is twofold. One, it's detrimental to the, the migratory waterfowl in this country and in the world at this point, because they've become so dependent on it. And two, if this dries up, the alkaline dust will kill everyone and we'll have to evacuate every house from Mexico to Moreno Valley. Really? And there will be nothing left out here but a big salty bowl. I mean, we've got, we spend billions of dollars on a bomb that can ring your doorbell and verify it's you before it explodes. Why not spend some money on preserving our country? Right. And preserving a landmark like this for, you know, generations to come, for our kids, for our kids' kids. This was a desert and now it's a sea. Think about that, dude. I mean, that's your planet ever changing, ever growing, ever adapting, ever persevering until we suck every ounce of blood out of it. The problem is this place is nothing anymore. No, this has no monetary value to anyone. No. It's just, this is where dreams go to die. It was interesting walking around here with Ramundo. He has a much different perspective, like, he likes the, the torn down stuff and he sees beauty where a lot of people see just garbage. It might not be the mainstream story and he might not be the mainstream dude, but that's, that's the world. It, it, freedom, dude, there's freedom here. And, and that's what I'm looking for in my life is, is the ability to, to wake up every day and do just whatever the f I feel like doing. You know, and, and if that's hang out right here and look at graffiti art and, and smoke weed or run into guys like you and, and, and answer some questions, uh, that's what the f I'm gonna do. And nobody's gonna tell me any different anymore because you could be here today and not tomorrow. And that's a fact, dude. And so if that's a fact, what the f are you doing with your life? Because me, I'm living mine. This is kind of like what's happening to the Salton Sea. It looks pretty good for skating. It's uh, a little dirty, but uh, it'd be kind of fun to roll around on it. Possibly sweeping up some toxic dust. It's a little rough, but I like it that way.
After skating the mini Salton Sea, I felt ready to face more real world devastation. So I met up with Kerry Morrison, who's working to revive the area with his organization, Save Our Sea. So off to our left, you'll see areas that I call the fingers. Um, there were a bunch of little boat launches and places where people had docks off the back of their houses and would have been a really cool place to live. Some of these are pretty nice custom homes that are just a little, little yeah. neglected now because people aren't quite as happy about where they live. Right. A um, year and a half ago, this had water all in here. Not enough to launch your boat, but at yeah. least a lot, a lot more. It's gone down really quick. The Fingers is actually a recent development. It was an attempt to revive the Salton Sea in the late 80s, designed to be a retirement haven where you could boat in and out of your own private canal. I think it's interesting that so many people wanted to live on the water and built docks. You know, everyone wanted a boat. It, yeah. it was kind of their American dream, and they, they moved to a place where they can get a great deal with a house on the water and have a lot of fun with their families. And there's not enough water for that here now, yeah. unless we bring some water in from the ocean or significantly uh, reduce the amount that we're using with the sea at the moment. Right. I was just talking with Carrie and one of the neighbors came out. I'm kind of interested to see what it's like for him to live here. So you live right here on these canals? Yeah, yeah, uh, family bought the place in 89 and we paid 5,000 bucks for the property and it's cheap to live and obviously it's a beautiful place to live down here. Um, do you guys notice the smell? No. Not, not right now. I know it's like every so often you smell it, but I, I've already gotten used to it where yeah. I don't even really notice it. I'm so used to it now. <laughs> It really doesn't affect me too much. Every once in a while it gets really stinky down here, but it's something you can live with. Can you tell me a little bit about what's happened here with the canal? Well, you can see my dock down here that yeah. I used to run my RC boats out here, and, and now it, it's, it, it's probably about waist deep, I want to say. Yeah. Probably the deepest at it at all. Yeah. You know, and, they, and they're charging us. Uh, a channel maintenance fee in our, our taxes, you know, it's like there's no channel here. It's right. really kind of ridiculous, um, just bureaucratic bullshit. Have you seen a lot of people leaving the area recently because of the uh, the changes here? I, I think from around the areas of the sea, yeah, people have moved away from the water. You know, at least it was, you know, you're on the water. Now I'm, I'm on a mud pit. What do most people around here really want? You know, um, we want it restored. We want to be able to play in the water again. That's the whole thing. That's why we moved here. It's so toxic, you know, it's just really corrosive. Even on the boats, you'd have to wipe the stuff down. It would just turn white after a little while. It kind of makes me wonder, the two people here uh, that used to live in these houses, they both died of cancer. Oh. And the people on the end had cancer, and the people next to me had cancer. So it kind of freaks me out, you know, right. what, what the conditions are down here. People kind of, they don't understand why I'm living out here, but. I live here too, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's... You, you understand then. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a different way of life. It take, took me a little bit, you know, getting used to it, being a snowbird coming down here just during the winter. Now, summers are horrible down here, but if you got good AC, you're good to go. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Government funding has been pledged to reduce the pollution in the sea. But Greg's not getting his hopes up. They said in 20 years it's going to be cleaned up. Well, I'm hoping I can still water ski by then. Right, yeah. You know, really what it comes down to. The bones of dead fish bleach in the sun at the edge of the Salton Sea, a sea that Carrie is trying to save. So right now we're walking on seabed? Yeah, probably would have been close to our waist a few years ago. And is this the stuff that the wind would pick up and cause problems with for uh, people's health? Yeah, you could kick it up and see that it'll make some dust. Yeah. Um, some places are a lot more, some places are a lot less. How long does the Salton Sea have left, do you think, if nothing gets done? Without setting up new water source, we're looking at probably five, six, seven years until the fish won't make it. Mm -hmm. And that's when the birds that are here or come here die or don't have anywhere to go. 
then the longer we wait, the bigger the dust storms get. I mean, look at here, from here to there is five years. Yeah. Luckily, there is unlimited water uh, fairly close, about 120 miles south uphill from here. Uh, there's the Sea of Cortez, the Pacific Ocean. Right. For the price of a single B-2 bomber, we could bring a pipeline downhill from the ocean and have enough water to maintain this region for generations. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to us what we do with it. Do we desalinate it, filter it, let it sustain the salt and sea? Do we drink it? Those are our choices, but we need that water here. People need to look at that more like, what's it gonna cost to not do anything or what's it gonna cost to do something? And it's almost always About 10 better. times as much. It's almost better, always better to do something. To act now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, act now. The future for the Salton Sea seems uh, iffy. It's a huge problem with some very complicated fixes, expensive fixes anyway. The thought of this place uh, drying up and then turning into a big dust bowl that kicks up big dust storms that have a lot of toxic and bad things in them is uh, pretty terrifying. I do believe that it is a super important place that needs to be protected. I don't know, it's, a, it's an oasis in its own way. Looking at it now, it's hard to believe that this area used to be teeming with happy tourists. These seaside towns have been choked out for decades as California's largest body of water gets smaller and more polluted. In a way, it still looks beautiful, but the Salton Sea is in grave danger of turning into a toxic dust bowl. 300 miles north, west of Death Valley, lies the future of the Salton Sea if it dries up. Owens Lake, a battleground for the water wars between farmers and the city of Los Angeles a century ago. Los Angeles won. In 1913, the city of Los Angeles started taking water from this valley. And by 1924, this entire lake was dry. Apparently, you can fit all of San Francisco into the size of this lake bed. Pretty big. The water should be above my head here. This is the town of Keeler. It's right on the lakeshore, or whatever this is called. I don't think it's called lakeshore if there's no lake anymore. There's a term for the dust storms they get here. They call it the Keeler fog. I guess the wind blows up the dust in the lake, or the lake bed, and picks it up and carries it into the village. And then they have these warnings that uh, tell people to stay at home when this is happening. Probably bum your whole day out. Wouldn't want to have a picnic that day. Right now, it's super peaceful. It's nice and crisp. No breeze, really. No one's around. It's not that early, is it? No. Maybe there's a Keeler fog warning and we didn't get it. What's it like living in a lakeside town after the lake's gone? I went to meet up with a local pirate radio fanatic to find out. Morning. Morning. You Steve? Yeah, Rick. Steve McGreevy. Hi. Hi. Nice Hi. To meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Great. Thanks yeah. for meeting us. Yeah, welcome to my uh, hideaway here, my radio uh, laboratory hideaway. Oh, wow. This, this is a little bit change of lifestyle from my San Francisco Bay Area corporate financial district days. But okay. Here we are. <laughs> wow. So, and these are all radio These are all radio antenna? antenna. I'm a ham radio operator. OK. But that's only one tiny part of what I do. Some of these are for the, the, the FM radio station I've got here, oh. two of these antennas. But most yeah. of these are for hamming, for, for you know. Yeah, communicating. QCQ, CQ, how are you doing there in uh, New York or uh, right. Ireland or wherever, yeah. How far is your, your property here from the lake bed? It's just right there. This was like the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Okay. This was not a freshwater lake. This used to be a real severely sandy area out here. This was called the North Sand Sheet. When that sand hits this, this alkali dust, yep. it kicks up the dust into the air. It's a choking fog. Okay. It would be a dust plume. Right. Right on the town. Would it just sit there? Just right on the town yep. for hours on end. Wow. And you just have to hide inside and, and look out your window and see nothing but this, this haze. The Keeler fog got so bad that in 2001, 
the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the LADWP, was forced to pump water back onto the lake to slow down the dust storms. People thought they were actually going to turn this back into a lake, but there's not enough water to do that. Right. And send it to LA as well. Yeah. So they had to compromise by putting up uh, an irrigation system just to wet the dust. This is just such a complicated thing. It's complicated, yeah. The problem with Southern California is, is, is air pollution, the crudscape of Southern California in general. And I call it crudscape. Yeah, what's crudscape? That's what, L, that's what Southern California looks like. It's a crudscape of just like a hundred mile long city, right? Yeah. It never ends. You go from yeah. Palm Springs to San Fernando Valley. You ever leave the city? Right. It's a crudscape of- And it's all, and they all need water. It's a whole crisis that the desert Southwest is facing. As these cities continue to mushroom, we've really got a growing calamity coming in the future. I think in 20, 30, 40 years. There's just too many people with not enough too water. Many, too many people living too high consumption lifestyle. You know, everybody wants to, to have their McMansion and, and have a pool, you know, and have their pool and wash their little yuppie cars and all that. You know, that's water, 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 water. You know, you don't live in Mississippi. This is yeah. desert. Yeah. In the long run, this is toast. Hmm. One year, five years, 10, this hmm. is futile. On the really bad days, this whole valley still fills up with dust. I can create my own personal uh, Owens Lake dust storm. Same stuff as if I just hit this real hard. I don't want to do it with your cameras. Give me a, give me a hit. Hmm? Give us a hit. Give us want a hit? hit? Okay. Yeah. Here's here's a localized Keeler dust storm. This is just like what happens out on the Owens Lake. You know, this, this, see this stuff here? That's what gets in the air. You see that shit getting in the air off the lake bed, that white. Yeah. That's the Keeler fog. That's the Keeler fog that used to happen. Yeah, yeah this stuff. That dust. I think we got it. And that's what you don't want to breathe. Because uh, God knows what's in this stuff. Mm -hmm. Arsenic included. <clears throat> Clear my throat. Sorry. No problem. Keeler was a thriving lakeside town a century ago. The lake's long gone but there's still a few people hanging around. Uh, Vice TV. Vice TV. Yeah. You guys are Vice TV? But yeah. if you go on YouTube, they're all over YouTube. I'm Rick. Craig. Craig. Good to nice meet you. Meet you What's the short story? What do you think about the Owens Lake right here? What's going on? What's going on? Madness. Crazy. It's total madness, yeah. Is all the dust causing like problems with people's respiratory systems? Well, actually, back in the 70s, all the people here were on air, mostly old people. There's, we got a lot of younger people well, here. Like now, oxygen tanks yeah. and stuff? Yeah. There's all kinds of heavy metals, yeah. asbestos, alkali, boron, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. Is that yeah. like day to day you can experience that? Or is it when the dust storm? When the wind's blowing. Yeah. Other than that, it's paradise. I've seen people come in, oh, it's paradise. I love them here. Yeah. So, what do you think the answer would be for here to fix this place? An answer? Is there an answer? Some people say put water in the lake, but there is no water to put in the lake. I would say just quit messing around with it. Let mm -hmm. nature take its course. Nature is its own healer. Yep. It's just not going to happen in your lifetime. Yeah. yeah. Instant gratification isn't <laughs> isn't part of the That's forte funny. here. It's just one of those things that took a hundred years to screw it up, and if I take at least that long to for it to figure, find its own balance, you know. Sure. Well, thanks for talking with us, Greg. All right. It's good to meet you. You guys have a good trip. See ya. So we're gonna go uh, hit the lake bed? We're gonna go in the lake bed, yeah. Let's do it. Steve offered to show me what's being done to control dust storms on what was once Owens Lake. All right, let's do it, we're on the road. This is Hay Bale City, <laughs> literally. So what are the hay bales supposed to the do? The hay bales were supposed to shelter desert plants that they want to grow amongst the hay bales. Okay. And is it working? No, not, not whatsoever. The foolish thing about laying out the hay bales prematurely is they're getting covered. Okay, this is a good spot right here. Hey, they even got, what, a, what is this, a side? There's oh. a sidewalk. Oh, how pretty. Oh, this must be for the tourists. Oh, how nice. 
So over here, there's uh, a man-made lake on the lake bed. And then over here, they have all these sprinklers keeping the dirt wet. It almost looks like a farm. Dirt wetting is the best way to put it. Create mud. It's a lot of water being sprayed. Yeah, they're really desperate to try to minimize the use of water out here. Yeah. It's a real desperate problem the LA DWP is facing because the less water they're shipping to Los Angeles means less revenue of ratepayers in LA. It also means the city has to go on rationing mm -hmm. at least the parts that are served by this uh, area, which I think is North Los Angeles. Do you know where this water is coming from? Los Angeles Aqueduct. It taps into the aqueduct there and somewhere over there. Right. This is literally former Owens River water. The Owens River used to flow onto this lake bed and fill up the 100 square mile Owens Lake. Now it gets just enough to slow down the dust storms. The lion's share of the Owens River is reserved for the Los Angeles Aqueduct. 50 miles north of Keeler is where Los Angeles siphons off the Owens River. Behind me is the Owens River, and just here is the beginning of the LA Aqueduct. There's a plaque over here. What does this say? The entirely gravity-fed Los Angeles Aqueduct remains one of the engineering marvels of modern times and continues to supply water through effective and responsible management by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Yeah, the plaque doesn't really mention the devastation of Owens Lake. I can't imagine what would happen if this river would dry up. It's like four million people that are relying on this little river. Let's take a walk across the historic Los Angeles aqueduct intake. It's sort of like a big cement bridge. Goodbye, Owens River. Hello, LA Aqueduct. Looks angrier on this side. It may not look impressive today, but in 1913, this thing was an engineering marvel. The aqueduct allowed LA to grow from a small city of 300,000 to a sprawling metropolis in just a decade. It takes a lot more water than the Owens River to hydrate greater LA these days. They've added two more aqueducts just like it as the city ballooned to almost 20 million humans. How much more can this desert metropolis grow? I'm on my way to the old Cerro Gordo mine. It's just above Owens Lake. I feel like I'm in one of those old westerns. We're coming into the old canyon here. We're about to get ambushed by the uh, bad guys. Oh, wow, it's like a ghost town. This might be our guy here. Hey, Phil. Yeah, hi. Rick. Rick, nice to meet you, Rick. Great to meet you. Thanks for meeting us here. Sure, no problem. Phil is the air pollution control officer for the area. It's his job to ensure that the LADWP follows through with their commitment to manage the dust storms created after they drained Owens Lake. That's a big lake. What did it take for the people here to get LADWP to do something about this lake? <laughs> a lot of court cases. Yeah. The air district can't um, interfere with their water gathering activities, but we can require mitigation for the dust pollution. OK. So you can't stop them from taking the water, but you can say, hey, you got to fix this dust problem. That's correct. Now they're doing something about it, and, and is it working? It is working. It's a hugely successful project. Oh, great. Um, we've controlled dust by over 90% at this point. It took a lot of work and, and fighting, but the people got what they needed. A lot of work, a lot of court cases, a lot of settlements, a lot of negotiations, and you know, $1.6 billion at this point. Wow, almost $2 billion? 
almost two billion. So is there any chance that this lake could come back to be the full Owens Lake again? Why not? I mean, the water still bypasses the lake. Okay. But, you know, I think the question to really ask is, you know, if it were to, why would it and how could that happen? Right. The, it's, and it's really um, the way money works. The city of Los Angeles, I believe, grosses about $4.5 billion a year wow. on Owens Valley water. So I was just down at the Salton Sea and I was seeing the problems that they're having there and they're talking about it possibly drying out like how Owens Lake has. Do you see parallels between these two lakes? My advice, don't take the water. <laughs> yeah. You know, leave it as it is because once it's gone, you don't have it to fix it. And that's, you know, the story of Owens. You know, we this fix to Owens Lake to control the dust pollution isn't permanent. Right. You know, it's an ongoing um, cost. Yeah. How long can you put, you know, millions of gallons of fresh water onto a dirt pile? Yeah. <laughs> What do, you, what do you think about how people in Los Angeles are using the water from the Owens Valley? It's amazing how many people in Los Angeles don't understand where their water comes from. And I know that over the last couple of decades, there's been a, a force to educate the people of Los Angeles. If you can educate them about where their water comes from and the consequences of that water use, it probably would be used uh, more effectively. And there are way too many people there for how much water there is. Yeah, there's not enough water in that local watershed to sustain. So are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future? Well, it, it depends. Sometimes I'm a pessimist. You know, I get really down on the current situations. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes I see, you know, the resiliency of mankind um, to solve things and to actually, you know, understand things and self-regulate. There is hope. If we can survive, I think some of these harder times, um, environmental changes that we see happening and are smart enough to uh, understand our place in the world and our connective location and connectivity to the land and the other animals and creatures, I think that there's still hope. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day we'll figure out how to supply water to the cities of Southern California without sacrificing places like this. Until then, Owens Lake will exist only in our memory. September 2015, early Sunday morning, in Inyo County, California. And this is transmitting via the VLF to FM relay. Located uh, 3.5 kilometers east of Keeler. I went back to Keeler to catch up with Steve McGregor. He's an audio visionary who dedicated his life to recording the Earth's electromagnetic emissions and turning them into music. He offered to take me out on a recording session to see how he captures his Earth sounds. Okay. What is this? That's, that's the stand to hold the antennas up. Oh, okay. Yeah, to hold the uh, loops. Out in the field. The coil, the uh, loop antennas for stereo reception. Right. The only, the only way to get real pristine recordings is you gotta get away from this, this mess. Right. Get out of the, the man, the manscape and get back into the landscape. We're at the Viking Mine. We're 10 miles from Owens Lake and it looks way different. It seems more natural. That's for sure. We're definitely out of the Owens Lake human blight zone. That's the Owens Lake basin. We're setting up the tripod. Setting to put up the, the uh, loop tripod. Receivers on. And then I'm going to put the loop, the coil loop antennas on it. These are to capture the earth sounds. Now they're in a wangle tangle as usual, but you know the old trick with wires is to just call it shake. Yeah. There's a magic thing called shake wires. Crap. Stupid tangle bush. The problem with the desert is every little bush and thing acts like a snag. This is just right. Murphy's Law. So then I hook it here uh, to the upper one, hopefully. Yeah. OK. Yeah. This goes to about, you got it. Yeah, about yeah. here. There you go. It's really non crit uh oh OK, the wind did yeah, that now. the wind now. caught it. That's why I have a. Uh, 
Okay. Spread that out a little bit. Okay. All right. And that's all it takes. Turn. Oh, that's, oh wow. You ought to hear the cameras. The cameras are making trippy noises in this thing. Really? Check that out. The cameras are generating noise, too. See if you can hear it. You hear it? It goes to show you the, uh, the uh, invisible world of radio, electromagnetic emissions. <laughs> oh, that's, all, that's called alpha. You can hear that. Yeah, so you're and it's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does that. Beep, beep. No, it I sounds like music. Beep, yeah, boop. Beep, boop is alpha. It's Russian. That's yeah. Russia. That's beep, Russian? Beep. It's Russian, the beep, beep, yeah. This is like sound machines people use, you know, like to fall asleep. They put like an ambient sound on yeah. and stuff like it. Kind of reminds me of that. I fall asleep really easily to this stuff. Yeah. I, I sometimes do this solitarily, but it's always fun to have company. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Fellow radio nuts that come and visit, we'll, we'll head out into the boonies. It's a really nice way to connect with nature again. Let's just enjoy the sunset. Yeah. Watching the sunset over the desert, I thought about how out of place a lake would look here and how strange it is that right next door is a desert where Owens Lake should be. And then I thought about the shrinking Salton Sea and how blight isn't just in our cities. Humans create blight in nature all the time to build those cities. And as our cities continue to sprawl into the distance, where's the water going to come from to help them grow? Sitting here with Steve, it occurred to me, you don't always have to go looking for answers. Sometimes you need to just listen. <laughs>